This video will be an introduction to signaling, which is actually a topic that we introduced earlier. Just really quickly, if you follow this path down through metabolic enzyme activation and altered metabolism, then you might recognize glucagon and insulin regulation of metabolism that we did way back when. This uh, diagram is meant to be sort of a generic signaling um, pathway pathway summary. It's chapter 15.1 in your text, and I just want to go ahead and mention that molecular biology of the cell has been great covering signaling since the very first edition. So I'm pretty much going to go straight by the book because there's no reason not to. This diagram is meant to simplify the signaling process because once you get into the details of individual signaling pathways, things get very, very complicated very, very quickly. But there are reoccurring themes that if you are aware of them, it'll help you memorize 15 different signaling pathways and the logic of them will make sense to you. So the way that's done is with the receptor uh, proteins and the signal itself. We've talked about that enough that I don't think we need to cover that too much. And the idea that this receptor is a beacon going out into the cytoplasm, we've talked about quite a bit. Here we have uh, a series of green things that uh, represent individual components of signaling pathways, and that com contributes a lot to the complexity and the difficulty in keeping things straight. As far as the cell is concerned, what it provides is the opportunity to regulate these pathways, which I think you can appreciate is a very important component to signal transduction, but also to provide means for crosstalk between signaling pathways so that you can have unrelated receptors and completely unrelated signals that uh, operate in parallel in some cases, but often will switch over in this cytoplasm using these individual steps in order to coordinate in a very, very complex way different signals and different signaling pathways. And we'll talk about that a little bit. The other general thing to say about these green um, shapes is that by the time we get to the circle down here, it's almost certainly the case that we have activated a protein kinase. So what these pathways have in common is that uh, before going into any more specific effects, you can say that they lead to the activation of an enzyme that's going to take the gamma phosphate from ATP and transfer it to one or more proteins that will then go on to mediate the response itself, the specific response. So that we'll talk about protein kinase we already have, protein kinase A, there's going to be a B, there's going to be a C, there's going to be a G, calcium homodulin dependent kinase, etc., etc. So those would be right here in the overall process. Now once we get down here, it's important that you know the sorts of things that can be controlled by signal transduction, but we're not going to cover very much of that in this class because a lot of it is molecular genetics that we don't do, and some of it we just don't have time for. But you should be aware of the overall big picture in terms of the response part, the stimulus response pathways. And some of these we will talk about. So that, for example, this one right here, the response most likely uh, associated with a growth factor as this red dot, and this would probably be a receptor tyrosine kinase, let's say. That process is really just control of the cell cycle going from one cell to two. So we'll talk about that towards the end of the class. Differentiation is something that's associated with developmental biology, which is not what this class is. But it is also what happens in uh, cancer progression. Well, this isn't cancer biology either, but we'll talk a little bit about that in this class. And then the last day of class, we'll talk about this one, apoptosis. But before that, be aware of the fact that, if you haven't heard this already, the default fate of a eukaryotic cell is to die. So basically, they do this unless instructed otherwise. And that's where these A, B's, and C's come into play. And in fact, there was, there's a very important D, which is the signal that this cell gives to itself through autocrine signaling to stay alive. So the, the fact is that most of the cells in you that are alive right now are having to be continuously told to stay alive. 
So when these signals go away for whatever reason, then this is what's going to happen. The very controlled, carefully choreographed sequence of events that lead to the death of that cell. And another way that is usually helpful in organizing the bizarrely complex number of uh, signal transduction pathways is to subdivide them in terms of how far the signal goes in the signal transduction. So these categories have been around forever. So if the uh, signal involves one cell signaling a cell very close to it, then that would be referred to as paracrine uh, signaling. And that, uh, to me, is, is, is this too. So these are synonyms in my way of thinking. This is what we'll talk about with respect to um, nerve electrical communication in the nervous system. That would be just an elaboration, really, of what I would consider to be paracrine signaling. What's not mentioned in this diagram is a very common signaling process by which this cell communicates with itself, so-called autocrine. We talked about it in a previous video, so it's okay that it's not mentioned here. Uh, and then there is a type of signaling that doesn't involve the release of a soluble signal, but still involves the communication of one, one cell with another. This is uh, something that we'll talk about in terms of the communication and in the epithelial cell layer and what goes wrong in cancer cells. Um, what is conveyed by this signaling and what happens when you break it. And then uh, the large part of signaling, I would say, is endocrine. That is uh, signals that are released by one cell and received by another cell a long way away as a result of the pass of those signals, for example, through the bloodstream. So that could be hormone signaling, but it can be other types of signaling as well. And we'll really cover those first because we're going to do G-protein coupled receptors, which are very tightly associated with hormone signaling, although that's definitely not all they do, and with the endocrine system. So while we're speaking generically and before things go downhill completely, let me also mention that an advantage to this part of a signal transduction pathway is almost always going to be amplification so that it's fairly common that a single hormone bound to a single receptor here can be converted into, let's say, 10,000 molecules of cyclic AMP, leading to the activation of tens to hundreds of thousands of molecules of protein kinase A so that one gets amplified to many thousands, and that's a huge advantage of having multiple steps, each one associated with not only a regulatory phenomenon, but also an amplification phenomenon. And then finally, you'll see the term effector uh, throughout the discussion of signal transduction processes. And the way to think about that is just to imagine that this component of signal transduction, whatever pathway it is, is really the switch part. And the effector is what is what the switch controls. So this is the light bulb that is turned on and off by the switch. And it is uh, a collection of many, many different types of proteins that coordinate the response itself. But it's nice to have a generic term for that. OK, so we're going to get into details in just a second. And the details are going to be beginning with the nature of the receptor protein. And you might wonder, why not begin with the nature of the signal itself? And my way of um, answering that question is as follows. If you, if you look at things in, in terms of the signal itself, you can waste a whole lot of time memorizing things that won't help you at all understanding signal transduction pathways. Classic example is in figure 15.5 of your text. So this is the signal, acetylcholine. And the problem with it, in terms of describing, using it as the launching point to describe signal transduction, is P through D over here. So we'll look at what's going on. So here's the red dot. Here's the receptor in this uh, process. That's a G-protein-coupled receptor. 
And if you look at these tracings, you can see that acetylcholine is inhibiting this signal transduction pathway. Contraction is less here than it was here. So this is an inhibitory response through a G-protein coupled receptor. But acetylcholine in a different cell type binds to the same type of receptor, G-protein coupled receptor, but mediates a completely different type of response. And then finally, acetylcholine, same red dot, is in the skeletal muscle binding to a completely different type of receptor and this is actually an activating response. So here you have acetylcholine mediating a slow inhibitory response while over here exactly the same compound is mediating a fast excitatory uh, response. So that's what I mean by saying that you can just waste your time forever memorizing different neurotransmitter, different uh, signals in terms of the molecules. It's much better to think in terms of the nature of this because that does tell you a lot about what's going to happen next as a result of this interaction.